Hey guys, and welcome to Gwent, the Witcher card game. My name is Jagaris, and today I want to showcase for you guys the best legendary cards to craft, in my opinion. Because I know a lot of you have started to earn some scrap now, and you're wondering, what should I make? What are the best cards to make? And so that's what we're going to do today. The one thing I do want to say is that I do feel like, um, you know, a lot of the epic cards are probably worth crafting first, simply because with epic cards, they're way cheaper, you can get a lot more of them for your money than you can legendaries. Um, so maybe, I think it's maybe worth prioritizing your epic crafts first and then moving on to the legendaries. With that said, there are some fantastic legendary cards in the game and especially the neutral pool, which can be put into any deck, can really set you up with a bit of power in your deck compared to the starter legendaries, uh, such as Royal Decree. Royal Decree, I think most people should swap out early on unless you're playing a deck that revolves around a very specific singular legendary. Um, but anyway, with the neutral pool, I think the first of the three I'm going to mention is a bit more situational than the other two, um, and that is Villain Tretonmirth. So Villain Tretonmirth, other people call him Bork. In human form, his name is Bork. In dragon form, his name is Villain Tretonmirth. It's the same as Saskia and Sysenthesis. But here he is in all his, uh, all his glory. Look, he even says Bork on here. Timer three. Turn start. Destroy the highest unit on the board twice. Can I actually show you his premium version? There it is in black and white because I don't have it. But uh, basically after three turns, what happens is he basically does Scorch twice. So Villain Tretton Mirth is a bit of a tricky one because obviously if you have the strongest units on the board, then he go and, he go and burn you up, you guys. He go and, he go and blaze it on your side of the board. And we don't want that. We don't want that. So this is why I'm saying it's a bit more particular in that you need to kind of have a plan for when you want to play this. Um, and often for me, it's, it's kind of a card that I'll throw out in the final round. So once we get onto the third round, when I only have a couple ca cards left in my hand, um, and one of my cards in my hand, other than Villain Tretonmirth, is gold. For example, if I'm running Siri and I've got her back into my hand, I can then play Villain Tretonmirth, Siri, and one of the cards, and he won't burn my cards because they're gold, but he will then burn your enemy. The so he's a bit more situational and I a little bit tricky that. to get to grips with, but once you kind of figure out the value of him, he can be really strong. For example, I played a game today where I burned two 18s and two 11s with one villain threat and Mirth, which is basically like, I don't know, 60 points, just under 60 points plus his six. So yeah, I got about 65 points out of a villain threat and Mirth today. Um, so he's a really valuable card when used correctly. Um, and he's also one that you can have in your hand and if your opponent seems to be playing like a dwarf deck, for example, with boosting a lot of units or a spies nuff guard deck, you can kind of throw him out. He's quite good in monsters, which have a lot of low value cards. Often your opponent will have, you know, higher value cards than you. Um, basically decks that don't really boost. And that's why I think he's a worthwhile craft because once you get to grips with him, he's quite formidable. And I know he's very frustrating to play against. So next up, I have a card I just mentioned, and that is Siri. I actually have premium Siri. I found her in a in a keg. Here she is in all her premium glory. And uh, Siri is a seven strength unit. Round end brave. So brave triggers if you are losing. So at the end of a round, if you're going to lose the round, Siri moves back into your hand. And if you've seen this on my deck guys, you'll see me play her a lot. But basically the idea is that on a round that you maybe don't think you're gonna win, or on a round, uh, maybe I've already won the first round, so on the second round, if I lose it, it's not necessarily the game over. What you can do is you can play Siri, and you play Siri down, and then it kind of encourages your opponents to play more cards. So instead of passing, I'll play Siri. And then, you know, if I'm lucky, my opponent will then continue to play cards, which means they're continuing to shrink the size of their hand, which is starting to give me card advantage, at which point I then pass because I intended to lose, and I get Siri back into my hand. So she she's very good at kind of gaining card advantage against your opponents. The other way you could use her is if you're quite far ahead and you don't really want to continue with the round, you can play Siri on a winning round. And some people think this is weird, like they're like, why are you playing Siri if you're going to win? But it kind of forces your opponent to pass, because at that point, if they want to catch you up, they have to play enough cards to beat you. And at the point at which they've played enough cards to beat you, you get Siri back into your hand. So for them, they would have to go into a serious card disadvantage if they wanted to win the round. So she's still used to win card advantage, basically. And again, she fits into any deck. You know, having that extra card is nice. And she does synergize, like I say, with Villain Tretton Mirth, where you can throw him out um, on the final round, throw her out, and then throw out one more card um, and hopefully burn anything that your opponent's played because they maybe haven't played their gold cards. So that is the kind of idea behind Siri. And again, definitely one that I suggest you craft. It's such a great card. And if you find it in a keg, I definitely would pick it. 
Okay, so last but certainly not least on the list, we have Gerald Igni, uh, or some people call this card Gigni. When you play him, you destroy the highest unit on the opposite row if that row totals 20 or more power. And for those of you who are annoyed, I do know that it's pronounced Geralt, I just do that to wind people up. But uh, So basically, you plonk him down on a row on your side, and on the row corresponding where you placed him on the opposite side, if that row totals to 20 or more power, he will destroy the highest unit bracket S on the opposite row. So if that has a big row with one big unit, it can kill it. But if there's two units that have the same amount of strength, say, you know, there's a, a row with two units with 10 strength, then it will kill both of those 10 strength units if they're the highest ones on that row. And obviously not gold. So you can also use this against, say, a row stacked with three sevens. Um, and it's got a lot of potential to get you a lot of points. Whilst it's only worth four base value, this is a card that you can use to get you know, huge numbers of points. I've used it against, for example, dwarf decks where they've stacked one dwarf with loads of points and you just burn him up. And, you know, you feel bad for your opponent because it must be super frustrating, but that's kind of the risk if you're, if you're stacking one unit that potentially your opponent could play Geralt Igni and, and that could be a problem. So this is something that people try to play around by, say, spreading their units across different rows or not stacking their units the same amount of power or not stacking one big unit. And it's definitely something you have to be kind of aware of. And honestly, I find value in this card um, most of the games that I play. Very, very rarely do you end up with only getting four out of Igni. Uh, one thing I will say is if you're playing Igni, be aware that, you know, going into the third round, people aren't going to be playing very many cards. So holding on to him until then, you know, don't always hold off on playing Igni thinking, oh, you know, I might get a bigger one later on. Like, if a row stacks 20 or more and you don't expect them to stack that row too much further and you're on, say, round two, you're better off just playing him. The only deck I really wouldn't run him in is maybe a very control-heavy deck, a deck where you're already, you know, removing a lot of your opponent's strength. In those decks, you know, they may be unlikely to stack to 20 simply because you're doing so much damage. And in those decks, maybe Igni isn't the right card to play. But honestly, in nearly every deck, this gold card, you know, works and, and does give you a lot of points and is one that I would recommend using. So moving on to monsters, we have our legendaries here. And the one that I think is the best to craft personally is Caretaker. Like, you can make arguments for other monsters like Giel's or, say, Woodland Spirit, because obviously having weather effects and a golden card is nice, and, you know, being able to put that out is good. But the reason I really like Caretaker is because it's a little bit different every round, but it also helps to counter a bunch of strategies that are a pain in the butt. Because basically when you play this, you resurrect a unit from your opponent's graveyard. So you can use this to take a card out of your opponent's graveyard. So if you're against stuff like Northern Realms or Skelliger, where they have resurrects anyway, you can basically take, you know, strong units from their graveyard targets that they would be wanting to resurrect. And that works out quite nicely. If you're up against monsters, you could always, you know, remove one of their foglets, for example, to stop them from resurrecting that foglet if they're running a fog strategy. And you can just find kind of value in the cards in your opponent's graveyard. And the thing to be aware of with Caretaker is that it resurrects a unit from your opponent's graveyard. And that can be a silver unit as well. So you can actually get, you know, useful silver cards that you can pull off your opponent because they've played them. And that's why I personally really like Caretaker. Again, I think he fits into any deck. And I think if you're running a monsters deck, having cards that fit into any deck are really nice. And, and Caretaker definitely is one of those. And I think, you know, he's a really strong card. So next up we have Nilfgaard, and Nilfgaard actually has loads of really good legendaries. This is the one faction where I would say there are better legendaries. There's lots of better legendaries than there are neutrals. Mostly when I'm playing other factions, I'll definitely run, you know, like an Igni or a Siri or a Villain Tretemuth, one of those kind of neutral cards that synergizes with the deck. But with Nilfgaard, there are a lot of good ones. Um, and I think the one that I will say I think is the best to craft is going to be Tibor. Even though he is getting a nerf, he's going from a 10 strength to an eight strength. But with Tibor, when you play him, provided your opponent hasn't passed, that's what Clash means, he boosts himself by 15. So with the nerf, he'll go from an eight to a 23. And then your opponent draws and reveals a bronze card. So they get a bronze card and you gain 15 points on your on your Tibor. So he's basically worth 23. He's a big tempo card. And he's one that a lot of people hold on to until the final round to just have that big tempo play at the end when your opponent doesn't have a lot of cards. I mean, yes, they do draw a card and reveal it, but it's not, you know, often that that drawn card is going to be worth the 15 points that you boost from Tibor. And on top of that, those 15 points are on a golden card, which means they're very hard to target. You know, he's not easily targetable by things like Scorch um, or Igni unless they have Shackles. So he's quite a safe tempo play as opposed to other tempo plays, which can be removed with damage. I think Tibor is really good. And although he's taking this two point nerf, I think he's still going to be viable in the next patch. I still think he's a good card and he fits into any Nilfgaard deck. 
Other good cards, obviously you have ones which have synergies with reveal, such as Vatia, like if you're running a reveal deck, I think Vatia is a fantastic card. But you know, if you're not running a reveal deck, then you don't really get the value out of him. So I don't think that he's, you know, the most useful card in Nilfgaard because he doesn't fit into, you know, every deck. Similarly, Letho, he's like kind of designed around spying, as is uh, Menno, destroy all spying units. So whilst these cards are, you know, good in their own decks, they're, they're more specific. And I think because they're more specific, it's harder to determine it's harder to determine like whether they're worth crafting or not and i think like when you're first crafting legendaries you want ones that you can fit into lots of decks i mean another potential option would be vilgefortz you can use him to destroy an ally and then play the top deck from your card he's also good again fits into any deck so if you're not feeling safe with tibor because of the nerf then again vilgefortz is another potentially good option uh, because he gives you deck thinning as well you play him you destroy a small ally and then you pull a card from your deck and play it you can also use him to destroy a big enemy, but then your opponent draws a card. So, you know, that enemy that you destroy better be worth a lot more than the revealed card. But this is the other option in Nilfgaard to craft. I would say Tibor and Vilgefortz are the ones that you're you're maybe looking to go for first. Um, next up, we have Northern Realms. And Northern Realms is like the complete opposite of Nilfgaard. Whereas Nilfgaard had loads of fantastic legendaries, Northern Realms, I think their legendaries are really lacking. I think they don't really have that good legendaries to the point where... Potentially the best legendary is Philippa, which is the one that you get for free. So you get Philippa Ilheart for free um, when you start playing Gwent. You play her, she damages an enemy by 5, and then damages random enemies by 4, 3, 2, and 1. And the same enemy cannot be targeted twice in a row, so you can't use this on one target. But provided your opponent has played two or more um, units, what will happen is that you'll hit Vaughn by 5, then it'll bounce the other one and hit 4, then bounce back and hit 3, and 2, and 1. So potentially with this card, you're getting, I think it's 16 damage, or 16 total strength basically if you hit every hit and although she's only worth one herself like the potential for removal is really huge so she's really good but you don't have to craft her the one i would say is worth crafting is shani shani is the option for resurrect in northern realms and i know it kind of feels bad because skellige has loads of resurrect and skellige has like bronze card resurrect but that's kind of part of their archetype and northern realms if it has too much resurrect i think is too strong but shani is a really nice option. You deploy her and resurrect a unit from your graveyard and add four armor to it. So you can use this to regain a silver or a bronze card. And this has a lot of potential because if you go for, say, a silver card, you get to basically replay its ability, which is really cool. There's a little bit of armor synergy going on with this four armor. And it's also really nice with cards like Henselt, the leader, because Henselt, he summons all copies of a bronze ally. So what you can potentially do with Shani is resurrect a bronze ally and then use Henselt to pull the rest of the copies from your deck. So there's, there's definitely synergies with you know some of the leaders here and i think she's the one that fits again into any deck whereas some of these cards i don't think many of them are particularly good but some of them for example like john natalis are you know designed around archetypes like machines for example so you know i don't i don't see him fitting into any deck kira metz is just terrible because she's like a silver mage but gold so you have the silver mages these are in every faction um for example we have where is the one for us oh, here i go death mold so this is the nilf uh Nilfgaard, Nilfgaard, Northern Realms, uh, this is the Northern Realms Mage, and what it does is it spawns a weather effect, a clear skies effect, and a spell effect, so in this case his spell effect is Alza's Thunder, and each faction has a silver card that does this, whereas for some reason, Kira Metz is legendary, and she gives you Quensign, Epidemic, or Thunderbolt Potion, so she doesn't do weather and clear skies, but it's not worth a legendary slot to have these, whereas the mages, the silver mages are really good, and definitely, you know, take up a slot quite nicely, Kira is just, she's just, where is she? She's just not good enough. And this is kind of the problem I have with a lot of Northern Realms cards, is they're just not good enough. And I definitely think their legendaries need some love. Next up, we've got Scoia'tael. Here is Scoia'tael in all its glory. And there's a couple cards I think are, are pretty good in Scoia'tael. Uh, the one that I think fits in every deck, I actually haven't crafted it yet because I've been focusing on doing deck guides for you, which require very specific golds. But Saskia is very good. Orders triggers when you play your leader ability. So when you play your leader ability, Saskia then gets summoned to a random row. So if you play one of your leader abilities, you get a bonus seven points attached to them because it pulls Saskia from your deck. And you can then combo this actually with Roach because Roach is a neutral card. And what Roach does, she's got five strength and she summons whenever you play a gold card, excluding leaders. So although if you play your leader, it won't pull Roach. If you play your leader and your leader summons Saskia, then what Saskia does is then pulls Roach, which means that when you play your leader ability, you can get a 12 point swing, which is a really big tempo uh, play. So I actually really like Saskia. I think, again, she fits into any of the deck archetypes for Scoia'tael and can provide you with a lot of strength. 
The other one worth mentioning is actually getting a nerf, uh, and that is Ithlane. But I still think Ithlane is going to be worth playing. She's going from a 2 strength disloyal unit to 4 strength disloyal unit. So the way this works is you give your opponent 4 strength, you give your opponent um, 4 strength, and then you play a bronze special card from your deck, and you can choose the one. So it's a targeted draw, and then you spawn a copy of it. And because Squirtel has a lot of special card synergy, you can actually use this to basically double play a special card. And you know, that could be a first light. You can then use the, the first light to clear weather if that's been played upon you, and then also play a rally. So you can use it to play um, first light, which then gives you clear skies or rally. Use the first one for clear skies, use the second one for rally. I've used this with Adrenaline Rush to basically uh, give resilience to two units rather than one. Um, you can use this with Thunderbolt Potion to buff up your units, you know, really nicely in dwarf decks. It has a kind of a lot of different uses. This one's a bit more situational because obviously you need to have the special cards in your deck. So it means that you have to put them in there and have enough that, you know, she'll still be viable if you find her later on. Whereas Saskia, you know, is more or less constantly viable. But those are the two that I would go for if you're looking to craft in Scoia'tael. And last but not least, we have Skelliger. And Skelliger's another one where I think there's, you know, a little bit of a little bit of love is needed because they do have quite a few a few legendaries that I feel like don't really see play. Ceres, for example, has a lot of potential but doesn't see play because it's just you're, you're resurrecting another an extra six, but she can only do it once and it requires four resurrects. It's it's a bit situational. Can be is it a gigantic clusterfuck? Um, I'm not even going to go into it. You know, there's plenty of content on there on Canby. You can you can find out about this. Uh, but the cards that I would say are worth crafting for Skelliger, there's two. First and foremost, Wild Boar of the Sea. Wild Boar of the Sea, turn start, strengthen the unit on the left by one and damage the unit to the right by one. So you can use this to basically buff up a unit on its left. And because you're strengthening it, that means that its base value is increasing. And provided that card doesn't have a regressing tag, it will keep that value when it goes to the graveyard. And because Skelliger is very much around resurrecting, you can basically use Wild Boar of the Sea to start buffing up a unit. And then once that unit is buffed up, what you can then do is resurrect it. So it's kind of giving you points for the future. So it's, it's often worth a lot more than just the six value on the card. The damage can be useful. You can use it to maybe clear, for example, a Rot Tosser. I've done that before. Um, or to set up some, you know, weakening synergies with, uh, with Wild Boar of the Sea. But I think this, this strengthening feature is what I really like about it. Um, the last card I want to mention is Hjalmar. Hjalmar uh, is a 15 strength gold card. Deploy, spawn a Lord of Undvik on the opposing side. Whenever an enemy Lord of Undvik is destroyed, boost self by 10. So basically what you do is you play your 15, you give your opponent a 5, and then you kill it, and your 15 becomes a 25, which is a big tempo change. So Hjalmar is like a Skelliger option for tempo. He's still worth, you know, 10 points if you don't manage to kill the Lord of Undvik. So even if you don't have removal, you know, it's still a decent amount of points attached, but with the potential for, you know, 25 points, in a gold card. It's similar to Tibor, you know, it's it's a big tempo swing and I think it has potential and it can fit into any deck. And that is really the theme I've had here is that you want to have cards that can fit into any deck. I think that's important. Um but yeah, that's it in terms of the in terms of the legendaries that I think are worth crafting. I definitely think you should check out the epics. I'll have a video going up on the channel this week recommending epics to craft, but I definitely think you should have a look into the faction's epics before you maybe settle on a legendary, because like I say, you can get four epics for the cost of one legendary, so, you know, it's a it's a big difference. Um, beyond that, you know, let me know your thoughts on legendaries in the comments below. If you disagree, you know, feel free to say so, say why. What do you think about, like, for example, Skellige and Northern Realms, where, the, you know, some of their faction legendaries are quite lackluster? You know, how do you feel about Nilfgaard, for example? Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Um, and yeah, beyond that, keep an eye out for my epic crafting suggestions video. I don't know what I'm going to call it. Have a fantastic day. Thanks for watching, and hopefully I will catch you guys in the next video. Bye!